good afternoon and thank you so much for taking time out of your day or their, your Friday to answer these questions for the student body. They're extremely important and thank you for understanding that. Of course. And so uh, to start, tell us more about your schedule. How has it been in the winter session between holidays and planning for the spring? I imagine it must have been hectic. Uh, it was, um, as, as you as you know, and uh, as everybody knows, we're we're dealing with unprecedented times, and uh, I think one thing to emphasize is the fact that uh, we're adapting to the situation. So anything we do has to be uh, to a certain amount fluid because the situation is changing. You know, certainly last semester, I think it went pretty well in the end, and. Uh, um, although I think, uh, you know, some students and faculty felt like the, the condensed semester was a little tight and that they were working extra hard. I think in the end, people, people came through and, uh, everybody deserved a well needed rest over the, over the, over the holidays. We were hoping that the spring semester, the COVID, uh, situation would be much improved and, and we would be able to have, uh, uh, a more normal sp spring, but but it became slowly, it surely became evident that that was not going to be the case. Um, we did have more faculty uh, sign up for in-person teaching because we know that a no, you know students who are, are, are residential and, and otherwise had asked for that, uh, and we did um, have those listed. I think it was almost thirty percent of the classes at Florham and uh, uh, somewhat fewer than that at Metro, but still quite a lot. Um, but uh, clearly at the moment, the, uh, the, the COVID situation is, is pretty bad. And, um, you know, the numbers are not in our favor and everybody's worried about these new, new variants. So obviously uh, we met, and as you saw from the president's memo, we decided to give everybody a little bit more time and to start the first three weeks of the semester with remote teaching uh, only. Uh, we're still welcoming students who, who want to come back to campus to come back to campus at their original uh, schedule. Uh, so certainly if students want to be on campus, they're welcome to do so. We're opening certain things up, you know, uh, including the libraries so that there'll be places for them to go and things for them to do if they do come back. Uh, but we thought it prudent to keep the uh, instruction remote to begin with. It gives everybody a little bit more time to see how things are going to go. And, um, and we're hopeful that, uh, that we can start the in-person classes on February 15th. And that's certainly what we've planned. Um, so let me stop and see if you have any questions about any of that. Um, no, not at all. In fact, um, back in November of 2020, a list of in-person classes were sent out. So um, do you know if this is the same list, if it is the same list, or has anything been changed? Um, as I said, this is a fluid situation. So uh, I did hear this week that, that uh, we're going to have some discussions that some of those classes uh, may may change uh, to, to, to fully remote or be fully remote uh, at least for, for a while longer. Here's the issue, uh, Joanna, that we're, that we're grappling with. We have said that most classes that are uh, in person, and we listed them this way, as in person slash hybrid. And uh, let me just explain the two different types of hybrid we're thinking of. The one type is obviously all of our classrooms have now reduced capacity because we have to adhere and we should adhere to the six foot distancing and make sure that um, people can socially distance. Um, and that takes off, that takes away a lot of space because it's six foot in every direction. So classrooms that might have had a capacity of 25 or 30 now have a capacity of sort of 12 or 14, so, you know, or less, 10. So we have, um, we have used the classrooms that we can, uh, that have the largest capacity where we can. 
uh, but we know that for class classes that are larger than those sizes, there will be have to be uh, situations where half the class meet in person at any one meeting and the other half meet either remotely into that class or are given something else to do asynchronously during that time. And then the next time the class meets, it will be reversed. So everybody will get the in-person experience and the access to the faculty member, but it may not be all at the same time. So that's one scenario where we have to have it. And we have invested a lot, you know, a lot in the technology to make that happen. So almost all of the classes that are scheduled to have an in-person component are in what we call Zoom rooms. And that means either the built-in Zoom technology with a built-in speakers and a, and a built-in screen, or we have what we're calling Zoom carts, where a little bit like the ITV carts, we'll have a screen, you know, and the setup on a cart, again, with speakers in the room, so that students uh, would be able to join remotely if they need to. The second type of hybrid that we need to be able to accommodate is even if the class is all in person or a student is attending and planning to attend in person, but then that student either tests positive through the, uh, through the uh, through testing or is tracked to have been in contact with somebody who tests positive, then they have to go into isolation or quarantine for, for a while until we know whether they're uh, true positives. But we, they still need to be able to continue with their courses. So uh, they would then use this technology to zoom into the classroom to join that class remotely. So it's a little complicated, but we have to be able to accommodate for that. And I guess there's a third uh, scenario where some students may be in a class where the only section is listed as in-person hybrid. And if that student really does not feel comfortable or is not able to come in person, then we need to accommodate that student as well in a uh, remote format. That is complicated, but possible. And we're planning to do that. The complication comes even further with classes where there is an in-person component, such as a lab or you know, an arts class where they, it's a hands-on. We're still working on some of those. Excuse me, that shouldn't go on. Um, we're still working on some of those. Uh, and uh, I have a meeting with some of the, certainly with some of the, the, the lab science faculty next week to discuss how we're going to accommodate. Because we don't want to tell any student, and we don't plan to, that we can't accommodate their, their needs. But it's how we accommodate them that's that's the issue and and, and the third the, the other thing i would say is we are very hopeful optimistic let's say that things will get better towards the second half of this semester for two reasons one hopefully the vaccine will have been rolled out to more people um, and uh, the covid situation will start to improve and also the weather will, will hopefully start uh, to, to get better as well and the cases uh, should hopefully go down a little bit. So we're also considering, well, what, what, what we do at the start of the semester, aside from the, the three weeks we're talking about now, but for some of these other complicated situations, we might be able to uh, you know, have more of an in-person component and, uh, and a hands-on component to the, to the second half of the semester. But that's still a work in progress, I would say. So to continue off of what you were talking about accommodations, um, will, this, will this option, are there any conditions for who gets to choose more high risk per, as priority or is it simply a one? No, I don't want to do that, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about health issues here and uh, whether it's physical health, students really having, you know, underlying conditions or having family members who have underlying conditions and they just don't feel comfortable coming to, to, to class or, or whether it's just a mental health issue of some, somebody's just not feeling, uh, who's feeling too concerned to, to, to want to be in person. We need to be able to accommodate everybody. As I said, we, we're, we're going out of our way to be able to do that. It's just how we do that in certain situations is a bit more complicated 
for, for certain classes, it's a little bit more complicated than for others. So we have to um, figure out how exactly that works. Because if, if you have, if you can imagine an, an, an in-person lecture class, then although it's a little complicated, it is feasible and possible, and we plan to do it, to have some students physically in the classroom and some students joining by, by Zoom remotely. But if it's a lab, you can do labs a number of different ways. You can do an in-person lab, obviously. You can do a virtual lab, and we've been doing that in some cases, and some of them are very good and quite successful. But what's very complicated, and, and I would, haven't quite, you know, can't quite figure out is how if you have a mixture of students in person and virtual, how you do that lab. It, that's, that's, that's the complication and that's where we may have to, and we have to do a deep dive to look at the sections and see if we could put all of the remote students in one section so that they can do a virtual lab and all of the in-person students in a different section so that they can do the hands-on lab. And where there are different sections, that's probably feasible and we're working on that. But where there are there's only one section, then, then that becomes a, you know, something that we have to work on. So I, I would say rest assured to the students that we're going to accommodate you the best you know, we can, but we haven't quite figured out some of those finer nuances for those particular cases, uh, uh, and we're working on that. And, and actually so these extra three weeks of, you know, re because we're starting with three weeks of remote teaching gives us a little bit of extra time to, to, to really work on those fine-tuning those details. Got you. So many students are concerned with the quality of education. So um, let's say for art students who need specific supplies, uh, will FDU provide these materials? You mean if they're remote or, or, or if, they're, if, they're, if they're accessing remote? Obviously, if they come to, to campus, we'll provide whatever they, they need to do their classes as we normally do. Uh, we did have uh, situations um, last semester where we were actually purchasing materials and sending them out to students uh, or, by, or, or whereby students were, were purchasing materials. If, if the costs are above and beyond what, what you know, some, some classes, uh, courses have associated lab fees or costs associated with them. If there are any costs above and beyond what a student would normally pay, we, we have uh, reimbursed them. Um, so we're not asking any student to purchase and pay out of pocket for things above and beyond what they, what they would normally do. Okay, so um, also similarly, how will classes that use Adobe programs be adapted for students that are virtual? Um, you know, I can't promise to have every fine detail of every class uh, uh, today because I have to go uh, sometimes to the appropriate dean, director, or, or or faculty member to find out exactly how they're they're doing it. But again, um, we have done our utmost to accommodate um, students having as close to uh, a, a, an experience in their classes as they, they would have had. Uh, if those uh, classes were in person. Now, again, if it requires sophisticated software that the student doesn't have access to at home, then, you know, I have to look into uh, getting your answers back to you for, for that. Um, uh, but, you know, we, 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 because you can imagine there's a number of different scenarios. The students who need to have access to do hands-on things in labs, uh, hands-on things in art classes, um, we had film students uh, and, and trying to work out a way for our students in film who had to do their projects over the winter break uh, so that they can graduate and we worked out a system for that. But this is all, there is no one, you know, this term one shoe fits all uh, for, for these different scenarios. So we're doing it on a case by case basis. I know some of the situations, I can't say that I have at my fingertips all of them. So. If you have particular questions, I you know I can get back to you. But um, but certainly we're doing our, our best to get the software and whatever it is that we need to provide, uh, you know, materials so that students can complete their their courses. I completely understand. And on a similar branch, uh, there's also students that need to do clinical hours. 
as part of their program. So Absolutely. how will the first three weeks virtually affect uh -huh. them? Will they start? Where students are going into clinical settings, i.e. hospitals, for example, our nursing students, those are going ahead uh, according to the regular uh, semester schedule. Those are starting on, on January 25th. Um, I was speaking with uh, uh, the school director, the director of the School of Nursing, uh, Dr. Gutman, um, earlier this week. And she was telling me that the students who are going into those hospital settings uh, and the faculty who are accompanying them are actually getting the vaccination in those settings. So as you know, the priority for vaccines at the moment, or you probably know, is frontline workers and uh, hospital workers are certainly our frontline workers. So if students are going into clinical settings in the hospitals, uh, in our nursing program, uh, Dr. Gutman assures me that those students are, are also uh, being classed as frontline workers and are, are receiving the vaccine or will be receiving the vaccine when they go to the hospitals. So we're, we're hopeful that, um, that that all of the clinical, where they're in clinical settings, uh, can go can, can go ahead. Uh, again, Dr. Gutman told me for those students who need the lab uh, clinical experience on campus, they're just adjusting the curriculum so that they they will start three weeks later and they will do the lecture component first, um, so that they can accommodate those students as well. So everybody's like moving, <laughs> moving pieces uh, to, 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 to adapt to the new situations. A lot of moving parts. Yeah, a lot of moving parts, correct. So um, residents are mandated to take a test and quarantine in the room until they're cleared. But um, a question is what protocols will commuters that take in-person classes um, be expected to follow? It will be more difficult to contact trace or is there anything? Uh, we are doing contact works? tracing and again, we're still fine tuning and again, again uh, um, you know, taking a little bit of extra time to make sure that we adjust our, um, our, our policies and procedures to adapt to the new situation. So we'll probably be doing more contact tracing um, and sorry, random testing and surveillance testing uh, this semester, at least the start of the semester, um, you know, to accommodate the new, the, the new realities. And that will include uh, uh, commuter students as well. So is there any plans underway to adapt the mode of instruction if there is a new wave of cases? Like, uh, let's say if there is another wave to, are you fully prepared to go online again for the spring or what else is being discussed? Well, look, what we've said at the moment is uh, because we want to give some people some surety. So we've said for sure the first three weeks will be remote teaching only. There will be no in-person instruction. Um, we're hoping <laughs> that and planning for in-person instruction to start on February, the week of February 15th. But clearly, uh, this is, as we said at the start, a fluid situation. If the number of cases skyrocket in our area and, uh, uh, you know, either we get guidance from the governor that we, that we shouldn't do that or that uh, we feel it's not prudent to do that, uh, then we will adapt again. But I think, you know, we have no, we have no plans to say the entire semester is, is remote at this point. That is not our hope and it's not our goal, uh, but, uh, but we have to be um, cognizant of, of the ongoing situation. I mean, maybe the vaccines will get rolled out quicker. Um, you know, I was just reading uh, earlier today that the uh, president-elect Biden is changing the federal policy a little bit and uh, whereas the current um, administration is planning to hold back vaccines, uh, perhaps for a second for the second vaccine, uh, that their policy is going to change so that they get more vaccines out quicker. I don't know. This is obviously a fluid situation, but uh, if if more people get vaccinated and the numbers start to go down, then you know we will just to start uh, and and go ahead with our plans. If the reverse happens, or if God forbid this. Uh, 
new variant strains are, are, are detected wildly in our area and the numbers start to go up a lot, we will have to adjust to that situation, you know, but I, I think everybody's has to be a little understanding that we can't predict the future. And so we're just trying to get some certainty out to people now as quickly as we can um, with the understanding that we have a plan to, to start in-person instruction for mid-February, but we have to we have to monitor the situation and uh, adapt accordingly. And I, I think we're not alone in that as an institution. I think other institutions of higher ed uh, are in a similar situation. Yes, and uh, as you stated before, that every course is more so on a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends on the material and the subject. Uh, are professors in these certain subjects undergoing training for the scenarios that they may need um, either training for what to expect when they teach an in-person class in these times or in the emergency case that they may need Absolutely. to switch? Absolutely. We've, uh, well, first of all, in terms of um, remote teaching and online teaching, many, many of our faculty spent much of their summer last summer taking workshops that the university offered um, to improve, you know, learn new how best to do the online teaching, remote teaching. And uh, in fact, I and, and then in terms of the hybrid teaching using the technology, we actually have a session uh, for faculty next week where we're, we're going through in detail how this technology works, how to get it up, up and running and how to use it and best practices in, in hybrid teaching. So yes, the faculty are being uh, given as many resources as we can provide so that they uh, are able to, to do all of this smoothly. Having said that, it's not perfect, right? It's not a perfect way to instruct these classes. We're, we're doing the best we can. We've, we've, we've invested deeply in the, in the technology. We've outfitted it into the many, many classrooms and we're instructing our faculty in how best to use it. So I think we're doing as much as we can to try and support what is an imperfect uh, situation right now beyond our control. Yes, very unorthodox indeed. <laughs> so um, speaking of resources, are there any new resources that will be provided to help students with these new methods of instruction or how will existing resources like tutoring, tech support be adapted? Well, all, all of the tutoring, obviously, it's uh, a lot of it is remote now, but it's uh, it's certainly available, and I think it was heavily used last semester, and we plan for it to, and, and I'm sure it will be heavily used this semester. Um, uh, so, so, uh, and the technology obviously is in the classrooms, so um, you know, students uh, will be able to go into classrooms, for the most part, all of the in-person classes, I believe now will be in classrooms that have been outfitted with this technology. We also have made available for students, if students are, are remote and they don't have access to a, uh, a camera mic setup, uh, we don't have them, you know, for every student, but if a student is in that situation, they can contact my office through my assistant and request a uh, loan of a, a camera mic setup that we will ship out to them. So as I said, we, um, we made that uh, offer last semester and we make it this semester as well. So, you know, uh, if a student doesn't have a camera in, in, their, in their computers and they, and they request one, we will make every effort to, to ship one out for them for the semester so that they can um, uh, use that. That's very interesting indeed. Well, as so, I said, if we had a thousand students request them, I'm not sure we, <laughs> what we would do, but it's not the case. Usually it's a, it's a few, or we've even had a faculty member say, you know, cause who's teaching remotely say my camera's broke on my computer. So we've shipped one out to them, you know, so we do have uh, some in, in, in stock and, and we are making that, um, that available to people if they request. And uh, lastly, is there anything that you'd like to say to the student body about the spring semester, mainly those who are feeling um, some anxiety and concerns? 
Yes, look, I, you know, to everybody, I just say, we understand and we hear you. Uh, and I would, I would say two things, really. Uh, I think everybody is feeling a little fragile and a little concerned about this situation because it's unprecedented for us, right? I mean, I think a, pan a pandemic comes along about once every hundred years. So here we are, <laughs> and it's our turn. Um, so everybody is, is, is working their way through this as best they can. Uh, we understand people who are feeling nervous about it and we're trying to help and we, you know, we have uh, obviously our, our student, uh, you know, psychological services and, and uh, health services and everybody's uh, willing to just talk if they just need to talk or, or help if they can help. We're trying to, uh, we're also talking to faculty who also, uh, believe me, faculty would prefer to be in the classrooms teaching their students. Just as students, many students prefer in-person instruction, many of our faculty want to be with the students. Um, we have had, uh, last semester, we had uh, you know, a couple of forums where we had faculty talking to the students. And I think some of the students were surprised when the faculty said, I miss you. <laughs> we want to, to be with you. We wish we could be with you. Um, so I think the faculty are feeling the same. We've uh, run session uh, just uh, this week uh, with a whole uh, group of faculty in talking about how to try to, you know, calm everybody down, how to try to uh, make sure that I know, you know, we heard from some students that they had the perception that there was more assigned work when, when learning remotely than, than, than learning in person. And whether that's a perception or whether it was real, we've talked to the faculty a lot about that. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, um, you know, that given them ways to, to try to make sure that they can, you know, keep their curriculum going with, without doing that. We have, as you know, built in, I mean, unfortunately, we had to eliminate the spring break because I think just about every institution I know has done that. To, there's no way if we have people on campus that we want them to go off and party in Florida or something and then come back to campus. So we have done that, but we've built in some, uh, uh, rest days or break days, uh, three over the first, uh, you know, February, March, April. Uh, and we're talking to the faculty about really making sure that they don't give students assignments the day before that so that students can really take a rest and that the faculty really take a rest because it's stressful for the faculty as well. So we're, we're trying to do those types of things to make uh, everybody, uh, you know, take a, take a break when, when, when needed. And um, you know, we will stay in touch both with the faculty and hopefully with the students. I talk quite frequently with the student leadership on both campuses to monitor you know, uh, how things are going and whether we need to do some um, outreach to, to, to help people with this. But I would say that um, you know, honestly, everybody's doing the best they can. And uh, many of our faculty have gone above and beyond, I think, to try to reach out to students. Uh, of course, we'll hear about one or two cases here and there where students have been dissatisfied. We'll hear one or two cases where faculty feel the students aren't engaged. You can imagine, I mean, uh, talking about the cameras, when, when students turn their cameras on, the faculty feel that they can engage much better. And sometimes just by body language or eye contact, you could get a feel of whether students are really understanding what they're saying or not, but in some cases where the students don't do that, and it might be because they don't feel comfortable in their setting or for whatever reason, they don't put their cameras on or they don't have the internet bandwidth. It's hard, you can imagine if a faculty member's teaching to a group of black boxes, it's really hard to engage whether people are really uh, following along and understanding or even are there, you know? So, um, I, you know, I just think it, if everybody can, can try to, to engage as much as possible and, uh, and turn the cameras on when they can. We understand there are some situations where, where that's not possible, but where you can do it. So then the faculty can feel better, the, 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 you know, the, the, the tone of whether people are really understanding what they're saying or following along or, or they've lost them and, and it helps out. So I would just say everybody trying to engage as much as they can and, and be a little understanding and uh, know that we are uh, 
doing our best to, to make this the best experience and to get a full FDU experience. Thank you so much for um, taking time out of your day to come here, Provo Small. It was an incredible opportunity. Not at all. I'm happy to speak with you and uh, I wish you well for your semester. Thank you.